Okay, so thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so today I'll be uh, talking about some recent work that I've done in collaboration with uh, Sarah Teichmann's group at the Sanger in essaying the expression of the genes encoded by one of the most complex regions of the human genome. So this is the region that codes for the key receptors in uh, natural killer cells. So just to introduce uh, the, uh, uh, the subject briefly, the key receptors are the largest category of receptors expressed on the surface of uh, NK cells, and they have as major ligands uh, MHC class 1 molecules, which are expressed on the surface of nearly every normal nucleated cell in the body. Now the key receptors can be activating or inhibitory, and the activating cues promote the killing of uh, cells that have compromised HLA expression, whereas the inhibitory receptors prevent NK cell uh, mediated attacks against uh, autologous cells. So key receptors are important uh, regulators of NK cell function during events such as infection or cancer, but they are also key regulators in other contexts like transplantation and uh, pregnancy, which is the, the subject of, uh, of this talk. So to tell you a little bit about what goes on uh, during the early stages in pregnancy, in order to provide the growing fetus with access to the mother's arterial blood supply, the fetus-derived placenta cells uh, need to implant into the maternal tissue that lines the inside of the uterus, and this is called, uh, at this stage, the decidua. So trophoblast cells from the placenta invade through the decidua, and they move towards the spiral arteries, which they transform into high-conductance vessels. Now, this is a very um, delicate, invasive process that needs to be well-balanced in order for uh, pregnancy to succeed. So for the fetus to thrive, the arteries need to be sufficiently transformed, but also excessive invasion of the maternal tissue needs to be prevented, otherwise it may become threatening for the mother's life. Now, NK cells make up 70% of the immune cells that are present in the uh, mother's decidua in early pregnancy, and they are capable of responding to the trophoblasts by uh, recognizing HLA C, uh, G, and E, which are the only HLA molecules that uh, are expressed by the trophoblast. And moreover, it is also uh, known that certain combinations of maternal cures and fetal HLA C variants are associated with pregnancy disorders, in particular with preeclampsia, where trophoblast invasion is deficient. Therefore, NK cells are thought to be major um, uh, players in the regulation of the invasion of the decidua by the placental trophoblasts. However, the particular cellular interactions between the fetal trophoblasts and the maternal decidua are still uh, poorly understood. So to learn more about these interactions, Roser Ventutormo in, in Sarah Teichmann's uh, lab obtained single cell suspensions from fresh human decidua, uh, placenta, and matched maternal peripheral blood from nine uh, elective terminations of uh, early pregnancy. And these cells were assayed by single cell RNA sequencing using 10X uh, and SmartSeq2. So here in this table, you can see the number of cells that were assayed uh, per donor. So that was about two to 8,000 uh, cells for decidua and placenta using the 10X and uh, about 500 to 1,000 cells for SmartSeq2 per donor. Uh, so, um, these two types of data were integrated and analyzed together by uh, Mirjana Efremova, who is actually sitting here in the audience, um, and using a canonical correlation approach. So, in this plot here, I'm showing you the, the graph-based clustering of the combined data set of uh, 70,000 cells split into uh, 32 different cl clusters of fetal and maternal cells, which were annotated with uh, cluster-specific marker genes. So just very briefly, I'm not going to go through all the cell types, but on the maternal decidual side, there were endometrial glands, vessels, stroma, and immune cells. And on the fetal side, there were trophoblast cells, uh, fetal fibroblasts, and uh, placental uh, myelite cells. Of particular interest, we found um, three different populations of NK cells, which are those clusters there in, in different uh, shades of green. Now, in order to understand the function of these three populations, we moved on to quantify the key uh, receptor expression uh, in these NK cells. However, uh, correctly quantifying key genes is challenging, as I uh, mentioned already at the beginning. So the key gene family consists of uh, 13 genes that are encoded within a cluster of rapidly evolving immune genes on, on chromosome 19. So these genes have evolved from duplication uh, events, and so they have extensive homology uh, with, with one another, which makes it problematic for uh, read alignment and uh, quantification. 
One other uh, added complexity is that to varying degrees, each Kier gene is uh, polymorphic. So this table here shows the, the, all the Kier alleles for each Kier gene that have been described in the literature and collected in a specialized database called the IPD Kier database. Now currently this database lists more than 900 uh, different alleles, so aligning to a single reference of these genes is um, also inappropriate. So, and the final uh, complexity is that different individuals uh, also vary in the number and type of cure genes that are present in the genome. So here in this figure, you can see uh, a number of haplotypes that have been observed in an European uh, American population. So each box there is a, um, a cure gene, and each row is a particular haplotype. And there are four genes that are present in nearly and all individuals, whereas the rest can vary substantially in copy numbers so that each person can have anywhere between four and 20 uh, cure genes. So this is a problem in which the vast majority of uh, RNA-seq reads will match multiple genes and alleles. And if we were to rely on uh, the unique mapping reads, we would be throwing away uh, most of the data. So we devised a strategy in which we make the problem a bit easier by splitting it into two. So first we try to identify which genes are uh, present in the DNA of each person, and then we quantify expression of, in the single cells uh, by using a personalized reference where we've thrown away uh, the, the genes that are uh, absent. So for the, the first problem, we, we tried several different things. We ended up uh, uh, with a, a sim simple approach based on, on K-mer matching. So it's illustrated here in this figure. First, we collected all the alleles for all genes in the IPD Kier database. And then for each gene, we generated all possible K-mers of a range of lengths. And then for each gene, we found the K-mers that are most specific to it and that have at least a certain added distance from, from other genes. And with this, we created lists of K-mers that are unique for each gene. We then pulled the single cell RNA sequencing reads from all cells from the same individual, counted the exact matches to the gene-specific K-mers, and normalized this by uh, the expression of one of those four genes that are present uh, in all individuals. So we then ran this over a range of K-mer lengths and uh, thresholds on, on this ratio uh, of counts to find optimal values of sensitivity and specificity in, in simulated data. So we did uh, quite a bit of simulation using these uh, known alleles. Uh, so we're then applying this to our real data set. In our real data set, uh, uh, the pregnancy data set, we also know the truth because we used a, a PCR-based gold standard method to detect the cure genes so we can compare uh, how we perform to, to, to the truth. So uh, now sensitivity and specificity, they depend, of course, on the number of cells assayed and the, the depth of the sequencing uh, coverage. But as an example here, um, for 120 NK cells, which was what we had on average per individual, each one of them covered with, on average, half a million uh, reads. On a gene-by-gene -gene level, we obtain 100% sensitivity and specificity for four out of uh, 10 genes. And overall, we obtain, um, if we look at all the genes together, uh, we had 92% sensitivity, 91% specificity. Uh, okay, so with this step, uh, this allowed us to determine the genes that are present in an individual and build a custom reference. In the second step, we then competitively align each uh, cell to its personalized uh, uh, read ref uh, key reference and quantify uh, expression using a statistical method which we previously developed for bulk RNA sequencing and which is particularly well suited for deconvolving the mapping of reads to multiple very similar uh, transcripts. So very briefly, this has been published quite a while ago. Uh, this method works by modeling the mapping of reads to sets of transcripts and then partitioning the signal uh, from each one of the transcripts uh, with an expectation maximization algorithm. Now, one nice feature of, of this uh, um, uh, method is also that you obtain uncertainty around the expression estimates, which you can then propagate to, to the downstream analysis. So to give you an example of how the approach of uh, using a personalized reference can improve quantification. So here in this plot, I'm uh, showing you the expression estimates that were obtained using a naive reference that includes all the cure genes on the x-axis. So here, um, I'm representing um, this. Uh, and on the y-axis, I'm showing you the, the personalized uh, reference. So this is data from one cell and one particular individual. And here I mark the genes that are absent in the individual in, in red. So this is uh, put here 
just for visualization purposes uh, in this axis, but this number doesn't mean anything. These are absent. Uh, now, when we include the absent genes in the reference, we erroneously find high expression of cure 3 ds one here. And this is because this gene is very similar to another gene, cure 3 dl one that's over there. And this cure 2 dl one is a longer version of cure 2 uh, cure 3 ds one So when you remove the short version from the reference, the reads that were previously in line in tweet now, of course, go to, to the correct longer gene. So using the correct personalized reference gives us a value of expression for Q3DL1 that is fourfold higher than when using the naive reference. And this would not be a good thing to get wrong because these genes have complete opposite effects. One is activating and the other is inhibitory. Okay, so using this method, we quantify then the cure um, um, expression in about 800 NK cells in five individuals, and we observe differential expression of several cure genes between the three uh, NK uh, populations that I, I mentioned earlier. And you can see that on, on the heat map here. We also uh, confirm this with, with facts data. So for example, here you can see in this plot uh, that cure 2 dl one is preferentially expressed by the NK1 subset relative to NK2 and, and NK3. So, we quantify cure expression in this way and then join this data to the expression quantification of all the other genes and receptors in NK cells. And then finally looked at uh, cell, cell interactions between the maternal and fetal cells. Now I'm not going to spend much time talking about this because this is work mainly done by uh, other people in the studies, but just very briefly, to look at cell-to-cell -cell interactions, uh, Rosario Ventotermo, who is an immunologist, uh, curated a database of known uh, ligand receptor pairs. Then for a particular pair of receptor ligand, for each two pairs of cell clusters or cell types, and they looked for the most specific interactions. And to do this, the following approach was used. So first, you take the mean expression in the two potentially interacting clusters, and that's the observed statistics. The statistic. Then by permuting the cluster labels a large number of times, obtain a null distribution and compare the, the observed statistic to it to, to obtain a p-value that was used to, to rank the interactions, which then allowed us to create a potential uh, cell to cell uh, communications network in the decidia and uh, in the placenta. So in particular for the NK cells, this analysis revealed that there are potentially more interactions for the um, NK1 um, subset with trophoblasts than for the other two NK populations. And this suggests that trophoblasts specifically communicate with the NK1 subset and allowed uh, Rosette to come up with this potential model of how the three uh, subsets of NK cells interact with both the maternal side and, and the fetal side. Uh, for example, there are putative uh, inhibitory interactions uh, between NK1s and trophoblasts that include KIR2, DL1, 2, and 3, and NGLAC over here. But more generally, we also predicted other inhibitory interactions in the NK3 subset, so for example, through KLRB1 and, and TGIT. And this cycle here also suggests, for example, that uh, NK1s could help convert extracellular ATP to adenosine, which would otherwise be an inflammatory uh, signal released upon cell death. Also, although it's not shown here, we also observe high expression of pd one uh, in the trophoblast, which is a protein that plays a major role in suppressing the immune system. So collectively, what this shows and confirms is that the, the decidual microenvironment in this microenvironment, all damaging maternal uh, natural killer cell responses to the fetal trophoblasts are prevented, and that the environment actually has uh, notable parallels with that uh, around tumors. So to summarize, uh, accurate typing and quantification of cure genes from full uh, transcript single cell RNA sequencing uh, is possible. The decidua displays an unusual composition of NK cells that can be now separated into three distinct populations. And the three uh, NK um, subsets of NK cells have different regulatory, inhibitory, and cytotoxic capacity, as well as distinct receptor ligand interactions. So our methods for uh, quantification and the database of receptor ligand interactions, which is, by the way, called cell phone DB, are uh, already publicly available online. And um, the method for cure typing uh, is, is, will be available soon. We are still working on some improvements, including detection of, of copy numbers in addition to just presence and absence. Um, and all of these, these methods are um, widely applicable to other systems, so do check them out. 
And with that, I'd like to conclude by thanking uh, all the people that were uh, involved in this pregnancy study, in particular, uh, Rosario Ventutormo and Miranda Efremova, with whom I've interacted most closely. And thank you all for, for listening. Beautiful talk, a very nice resource, a fantastic paper. We have time for questions. Hi, uh, thank you very much for a really interesting talk. Um, do you think that cell-cell communication analysis could be improved by the same type of very careful alignment for other receptor families? Or do you think this is only specific to the cure receptors? So, certainly for, um, if you're looking at uh, T cell receptors or B cell receptors, you really need to use uh, specific tools to quantify them, to, to, to detect what is present and quantification. So I would say yes. For, for the initial resource that you built before you do the, the care quant, you essentially summarized all the single cell data and, and it was a completely bulk approach, right? The KMR search. So the cells were grouped within individuals, so they were used all together to infer the, the, geno the, the, the underlying DNA. Yes. And, and then, you used, then you mapped individual ones to see sort of variations. Is that all correct? So it was like a two-step approach with this key quant in the next step. So first you determine what is in, present in the DNA, and then you... You see you, where, where they are. For each cell, then you quantify expression. Yes. But, but would you lose, like, with the, with the sort of aggregation fully? I mean... I guess you find all the sites that you would then later look up. So the camera approach was sufficient for doing that. It's not like a more complex motif or something like that that you might not be picking up. I'm not sure I understand Blue it. Blue binding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um. I think it's fine. Thanks. <laughs> so, nah, it's good. So let, let me ask something else then for the cell phone DB because that's like most safe grounds for me. Uh, the... And I had some discussions with Sarah about that, but I, at first I wasn't sure about the, the, the permutation test, if that was necessary. I think this could potentially be written up closed form, right? That, I think Mijana, if she's around, should be <laughs> popping in. No, okay. And, and, and the, the, the other, other aspect, because a lot of people picking it up, right? So I think it's, it's a really nice, ni ni nice resource, but clearly it's per population. Mm -hmm. And essentially just looks at co-expression of, of, of those receptors and ligands. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the obvious extensions would be to see, should we look downstream of the receptor if, if those things, if we knew what exactly is downstream, if those are actually upregulated, because that you might want to see actually on, on, on a transcriptional change for association. Because currently we really just correlate those two, right? Yes, yeah. Is that something you guys tried? Uh, not that I know of. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Other further questions? Thanks, Angela, and for, uh, Angela again for the nice talk. Thank you.